being in this place, yeah. does it bring back some good memories yeah. for you? You get goosebumps. Yeah? You get goosebumps, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's always nice uh, coming back here. You know, I just said, my kids have grown up here, my grandkids come here. Uh, it was a wonderful ride. Of course, this, the stuff we're walking on yeah. wasn't here when you no, played. It, it was natural grass. Yeah, was natural grass. Uh, would this field turf have benefited Dennis yeah. Coleman? Listen, when when we we would when we go play on turf, we would go practice up at Foxborough for yeah. a day or so. And I said, man, I felt like I could fly. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I could fly. But you hear people complain about it. I, I don't understand that part. But uh, yeah, I, I would love playing on this. <laughs> All right, so you want us to do the rest as a sit down, or do you want me to ask more questions while we're walking? Totally up to you. We could ask a couple more and then do the rest sit down. Okay. So you played for John Anderson, correct? That's correct. So before John got here, before you arrived here, yeah. Brown football struggled, didn't win many games. You guys immediately started to win. You had two winning seasons here. How did that happen? Why did that happen? You know, it's interesting because I wasn't originally recruited by John. I was recruited by Len Jardine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was trying to figure it out. And, and, and someone said to me that, you know, Brown was 3 and 31 the three previous years. Yeah. And I said, that couldn't be. I mean, how does, how does that happen? And, and, I, and I looked it up, and it was. And I had come from programs in high school. Um, Scott, we were. 16 and 2 my last my junior and senior year in football and 25 and 1 in basketball in high school and then when I went to Arizona over 2 years we were 19 and 1 and won a national championship so, that's a big so, difference it's a big difference and you know the expectations were different and and when when I came and and we started winning I was like it was like we won a national championship. You know, the alumni were out, and every, and I'm trying to figure out how can we be so happy? We lost three games, right? Yeah. But but you know, you come to to learn the significance of it, and you think about back-to-back -back winning seasons. I think it was the first time it happened in 30 years or something like that, and uh, you feel good about laying a foundation. And then the guys won a won the Ivy League championship. You just said yeah. it. Perfectly. You laid the foundation for the yeah. 1976 Ivy Champs, the first one in I, program history. I, I think we did. John had a really good staff, too. You know, a Andy Talley and, and um, uh, uh, cut. <laughs> uh, Andy Talley and who were the other guys? The guy that... Oh, um, wait, the defensive coordinator was, uh, yeah. what's his name? Uh, Joe... Uh, Gosh, dang it! I can't, I'm. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hank, used to take him to games. Yeah, yeah, all the yeah, time. yeah. Hank Small was the uh, yeah. Hank Small was the uh, quarterbacks coach, and yeah. well, we he had a, he had a heck of a staff, and 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 he set the tone. Look, we're going to win, and we're going to win right away. And the administration, the thing I was impressed with also was the alumni, the, the alumni, the, the the base, the the Gil Baines and the Showkets and the Brian Wallace and and those guys. The, a, Andy Jocelyn, they got behind the program. Bob Hall used to come out. I tease Bob Hall, tell him he was the second best quarterback ever at Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I tell the same thing to Mark Donovan when I see him too. So and Jim Perry, too, Coach Perry, yeah. everybody was the second best. I get him. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. So a Philly kid, yeah. Darby, Pennsylvania. Yeah. You wind up at Arizona Western. Were you being stashed there by USC? Tell us that story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was supposedly a pretty good quarterback in high school and recruited by a lot of places. Um, but it was uh, late 60s, early 70s, and uh, I weighed 149 pounds soaking wet with rocks in my pockets. <laughs> um, but I could throw a football and I could run. Um, I was supposedly pretty smart. Uh, but if it didn't have to do with a girl or a ball, I didn't pay a lot of attention, although I was president of my class. And uh, boy, it used to make my father mad. Cause I, so I didn't study as much as I used to, as I should have. And so uh, Southern Cal recruited me. I was recruited by a lot of schools. Southern Cal recruited me and said, well, we're going to send you to junior college first because we can beef it up, you know, get, get a little bigger. 
and stronger and uh, you know you really got to pay attention to your grades and and so they said we're going to send you to Arizona Western I'm Yuma Arizona right yeah. so I went out sight unseen um, and I really enjoyed it changed my life uh, I, I said well I'm gonna fix my father I'm gonna study <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get him off my back and and so I did and uh, became a Ford Foundation scholar and a junior college equivalent to five base. I, I paid attention to my schoolwork. And, and we had a really good football team. We lost our first game. Uh, I started the whole time. And then we won 19 straight games and won a national championship. Wow. We had guys like Chuck Muncie was my roommate and Leonard Thompson who played for the Detroit Lions. We had about four or five guys on that team that played professional football. So tell me how Brown entered the picture. Because it seems like you were on track to go to USC. Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, Brown comes into the yeah. picture. How did I, that happen? I was definitely going to California. Yeah. yeah. Um, Scott, I'm, I'm sitting in the lobby one afternoon. We played our games at night because hot in Arizona. Um, sitting in the lobby and uh, watching the game on TV. And this old guy is sitting next to me. And he does like that, nudge me, and says, uh, are you Dennis Coleman? I said, yes, sir. Um, and he said, I'm Lou Farber. Um, I understand that you're a pretty good student. This is the first thing he said. Did he say anything about football? He said, I understand you're a pretty good student. And I said, well, yeah, I guess so, sir. He says, well, uh, I'm an alumnus of Brown University. And he went on talking about Brown. And I found out he was, a, he told me he was an Iron Man, uh, played on the football team. and. Uh, he was a legend in Arizona as a high school coach. And Scott, every week after that, I would get a handwritten note from Mr. Farber with clippings from her game. And he'd talk about Brown and talk about what Brown was and what Brown meant and all of that stuff. And he'd always end with something about my studies. You know, and I was, I was impressed with that. Uh, I started looking up Brown, you know, following them and saw that, you know, like we said, they didn't win many football games, but, so that's... So you had a philosophy teacher. Once that teacher found out that Brown was interested in you, what did that person say to yeah. you? That was the defining moment. We were in a philosophy class and Professor John Ahern, I get goosebumps when I tell this story. And Professor Ahone, the bell rings, he says, Mr. Coleman, can I see you? I said, yes, sir. And I'm like, what is, I'm ace in the class, so what is he? And then he says, well, come on down to my office. And I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to his office. And, and I'm trying to figure it out. And on the way to his office, he says, uh, look, I, I understand you're being recruited by Brown University. First of all, I didn't know the, how, how he know that. Yeah. Uh, and he start, just, we start walking to his office and, and, and he start talking about Brown and we get into his office and he pulls down the American College Handbook, right? Or college and universities. And he opens it up and he says, Brown University, seventh oldest university in America, blah, 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 blah. And he looks at me spot on. And, and he says, uh, if you go to school here, never mind Southern Cal and Iowa State and these other schools, if you go to school here, you go to school with the sons and daughters of kings and presidents and the very people that will someday run this country. And that's where you belong. It, it, every time I think of that story, every time, it, it's like it happened yesterday. And I, I, I left there like, wow. And you know you go and you keep playing, and then we you know we win we win the national championship in Southern Cal, and I, I remember Iowa State was Johnny Majors was at Iowa State, and they were putting on a hard push and everything, and I kept getting these notes from Lou Farber, I kept getting these notes, and then a couple other alums I'd hear from, uh, and it stayed with me, and my guys who were going on to. Uh, Cal and Oklahoma State and Oklahoma and these schools were like, 
Brown, what are you thinking about, man? Yeah. <laughs> they, said, they said, if you go to school there, you got to pay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then they were they were getting cars, and they, <laughs> never mind. That was, that was before NIL. Right. <laughs> I saw NIL before <laughs> NIL. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't a done deal, though, mm -hmm. until you visited Brown, and you were hosted by a wonderful man, a great basketball player, mm -hmm. Phil Brown. Tell me about your interaction with Phil going to Marvel Gym to watch him and his team play and how that tipped the scales for you, how that was maybe the deciding factor of you saying, this is the place for me. You know, it's pretty interesting because I was coming home from Christmas in Arizona and Brown says, okay, we'll fly you into Providence for your recruiting visit and then you can go to Philadelphia right from there. I, I hadn't really realized because one of the letters they sent was, was was talking about providence just being five hours on a train ride from yeah. from philadelphia i was way out in arizona i was like wow i can closer to home but but they flew me in but we couldn't land because there was a snowstorm so they tried to land at logan couldn't land at logan because of the snowstorm so we landed in new york city ended up staying at the house of my uh, arizona roommate and then got to Philadelphia, and it was during the break, during the, uh, right after Christmas, they said, we're gonna fly you back up. And they flew me up. Len Cherry introduced me to some people, and then they said, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta meet Phil Brown. And, and to this day, Phil and I are like brothers. And I met Phil, and Phil went to Harsh, man. Phil was brilliant and basketball player. And, and it, 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 Phil says, look, first Phil says, no way they're going to let you play quarterback. <laughs> really? Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He said, man, no way they're going to let a black guy play quarterback in the Ivy League. I said, well, we'll see about that. And But he started talking about the school, and he started talking about, he says, the other thing is you got to remember, you're coming here for academics. Phil was academic guy. He says, and you know what? If you decide you don't want to play football, there's no scholarship they can take away from you. You know, you can just stop. And so I listened to all of that. Go to the basketball game. I walk in the gym, Marvel gym, and one whole side is students. Um, three quarters of that students are African Americans. Big afros, the whole thing. I'm like, yeah. whoa! They didn't tell me this. It was it was it was interesting. And 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 Phil, you know, you had five. You know, you know, four out of the five starters were African Americans. The bench had black players. Yeah. I, I was, I was blown away. It, it was, I, I was not expecting this. Um, you know, uh, p people from Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia and and Washington D.C., Atlanta. I said, this is, this is pretty neat. And um, I enjoyed it. I still hadn't totally decided. I went home, and you know, I told my family, I told my parents, and, and you know, my mother, of course, said, look, I just want you to be happy. You know, you go where you're going to be happy. Um, and my dad was, you know, your mother and I can't pay for anything. You know, we're, we were rich with love and prayer. Yeah. That's, well, you that's mentioned, weird. and you brought up your parents a yeah. few times, so I can tell how much of an impact they had on your life. Your mom was a homemaker. Mm -hmm. Your dad was a janitor. Custodian. custodian. He said, don't call me a janitor. Okay. Call me custodian. Okay. So... <laughs> How proud were they to see what you made of yourself? Uh, you know, it is. We were, we were expected as kids uh, to go to church yep. and to do well in school. That was an expectation. Um, my oldest brother was an All-American high school basketball player, played at Villanova. Uh, the brother right under him was a hell of a baseball player. Uh, ended up being a three-star general in the Marines. He's now retired. My younger brother, who's the best, God rest his soul, best athlete out of all of us, you know, went to Rice and then ultimately graduated from Hofstra. Yeah. And, and our parents, they expected us to do well. They expected us to be kind and gentle. My, my mother and father were so proud of all of us. Yeah. Uh, my dad would, would, the shirt buttons would pop off of his chest. Um, and, and mostly when people said, you know, they called me Denny at home. He said, you know, Miss, Miss, 
I remember Miss Parker, I helped her with her groceries in the house one day. She wanted to give me some money and I didn't take it. And, and she told my father and he stopped me one day. I was, he says, you know, uh, I saw Miss Parker. I'm like, what did I do? Yeah. He said, Miss Parker said that you, you took her groceries in the house for her and you wouldn't take any money from her. I said, well, yeah. That's what made him proud. Yeah. All of this was great. Yeah. You know, but that's that's how we were raised. So having not seen your games live and in person, yeah. looking back at the stats from your two seasons here, Pete Petrus also played some quarterback. How mm-hmm. did that dynamic work with the two of you? Not well. No. <laughs> <laughs> not for a guy that wanted to play every snap, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I, I, I had to grow up. I had to grow up. I, I thought... I've always been the captain of every team I played on since Pee Wee football. Yeah. And and I thought that uh, look, just give me this team. We'll be going for you. We're going to be fine. Yeah. I don't need to switch in halftime and stuff like that. And you know, but John was a smart coach. You know, we we played Yale here. We were down 17 to nothing. I was starting, and I knew we were going to win that game. And we came back and we tied it at halftime, 17. And John made a switch to start Pete in the second half. Interesting. Yeah. We ended up winning, I don't know, by 15 points or something like that. Um, but I, I didn't quite understand that. Um, but, look, it was for the good of the team. And that's what it, that's what it took. Um, in, in hindsight, you know, I, I, I never wanted to be anything but the quarterback because I thought I was the guy to lead the team. Right. If Humbly, but... As a servant leader, there wasn't anything I wasn't going to do to, to make the team successful. So at the end of our senior year, I played a couple of games uh, as wide receiver. Because, okay. you know, that was what it was going to take to win. All right, so October the 27th of this year down at Franklin Field in Philadelphia, mm. always been one of my favorite places mm. to visit in the Ivy League. Mm. Uh, They are going to commemorate the 50th anniversary of an extraordinary moment in college football that you were a big part of. You'll be down there as well for that celebration. Tell us about that moment that took place, I believe it was October 6th of 1973. And did you understand the gravity of it while you were going through it? You're you're really good. You got all your stats. It it was the 6th of October in 73. I had not a clue of the gravity of what it meant. Uh, I just wanted to beat Penn. You know, I, 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 I was starting, Scott, to get the feeling, to understand um, the success that we were having at Brown and and the alums and, and the students and people in the community uh, here in Rhode Island. Uh, but going down to the game, you know, I think about it now, um, other than wanting to beat Penn, the significance of that game was my grandmother came to the game. My, my, my brother, the general and his wife, uh, brought Nana down to Franklin Field. First time she probably First got to see you play in college, right? First time she got to see me play. I don't know. I don't really remember Nana coming to our high school game. Okay. Right? Um, and we she had... 40 grandkids, right? Yeah. I mean, what are you, you going to do? How many games can you go to? Right. Um, but Nana came to Franklin Field. I used to sell hot dogs and hot chocolate at Franklin Field for Philadelphia Eagles games. Huh. Yeah. But but playing on that field, the, the, the Darby is a small town outside of Philadelphia. And and the then black section, right, where we grew up, there's an integrated town, but we lived in a black neighborhood. Uh, never had a key to my house because you didn't have to lock your doors. Everybody knew everybody. Yeah. Uh, but the town almost shut down. And and people were there. And I it, it was it was exciting. But to this day, my grandmother coming to that game, that's what that meant to me. So you and Marty Vaughn became the first black quarterbacks to start against one another mm-hmm. in a Division One college mm-hmm. football game. That was the significance of that moment. Mm-hmm. Besides Nana being there. Right. <laughs> um, you said you didn't even know Marty was black until the game had ended. Until, and you no, went to no, shake no, well, his hand and un- he took his helmet off. Un- well, well, until, until I saw him playing. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, Penn's got a brother playing quarterback. And Marty and, and the rest of the story, Adolph Belazare, 
uh, who was a star, uh, said the same thing. They said, man, we saw this brother come out with high, I used to wear the high white socks like Kondrich Holloway. Oh, yeah. He said, this is the high whites and the high butt. He said, he said, and you're running around. He said, get out of here. And, and after the game, we hugged and, and a, a friendship to this day. Marty and I talk at least twice a year. Uh, we try to see each other. And, and that summer, the following summer, summer of 74, uh, 73, I stayed up here to prepare for football. But I did go home that summer. And I would work out from time to time with Martin and Adolf. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was the beginning of a wonderful friendship. You talk about those high white socks. That's Dr. J to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Julia Service. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know who you're talking about. I know who you're talking about. But no, Kondrich Holloway played at Tennessee, the first black quarterback in the SEC, right? Yep. And Kondrich had the high whites on. I said, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so after Brown, you went to Georgetown Law School. Correct. Came back to Providence, worked for a law firm. You became the first black attorney for that law firm, correct? First black attorney in the history of the state of Rhode Island to ever work for a large law firm. Wow. To ever work for big law. And yeah. while you were here or when you went to Boston, I know you worked for Ropes and Gray, when did you get into the uh, sports agent business? You, I know you, you became friends with some members of the Patriots. Is that right? Oh, well, Is that how it well, started? No, how it started, I was at Edwards and Angel. Yep. And um, my roommate from Arizona, the rest is old John Segretti, um, had a high school teammate at um, Bayside High, Bayside High, I think, in, in Long uh, Queens, Bobby Hammond. And Bobby Hammond was a running back and had played for the Jets, and Jets for the Giants, and was released and uh, was then uh, Washington Redskins. He was trying, trying to get him to come there. And John called and said, hey, my friend Bobby Hammond, blah, 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 and he's, you know, he's looking for an agent. You think you can help? I said, yes, sir, I can help. <laughs> I can definitely do that. And, uh, and that guy, and, and Bobby hired me, and I represented Bobby, and, and he got a job with the Washington Redskins, and that's, that's how it started. And, and that allowed me access. Okay. Right, and and, yeah. and then I'm next thing you know I'm in the Washington Redskins locker room and I'm yep. doing things and and then I got the uh, in, in the negotiation business to represent players I got a break and I represented Shelby Jordan and 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 then I was off and running former Patriot great yeah yeah and that, that Shelby to, to, to Tippett to Robert Weathers and Clarence Weathers and yeah. Lynn Dawson and Tony Collins and just I had about 12 Patriots and Pat Sullivan didn't like me for a minute, <laughs> <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> he didn't take a swing at you like he did Matt Millen no no <laughs> he wasn't going to do that <laughs> um, so uh, you uh, obviously You've been involved with Brown University for many, many years since your graduation. You've given back to your alma mater so much. You talked about your mom and dad. You're also a dad. I am. And your son, Dustin, works here for the Department of Public Safety, and he trains the uh, uh, service dog, yeah. Elvie. Yeah. How proud are you, Dustin? Yeah, my, my, I'm, I'm, I'm my dad, what my dad was to us kids. Yeah. Um, I'm just so proud of that boy. You know, young man. I mean, he's, he's first of all a really good son, a great father, and I suppose a wonderful husband, <laughs> um, and, and loves his kids. But he, he will tell you that he grew up here. Um, when I was broadcasting games, because I did some broadcasting. Uh, on WBRU? Like you, yeah, w, uh, no, 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 no. With Eric Reed. Eric Reed? Oh, on, okay. On, 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 yeah, no, we we did, and, and I did one year with Frank Carpano. How about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. My oldest brother thought that that's what I was going to end up doing, you know, being an analyst, you know, for football and basketball. But I, I, I would walk up those steps and, oh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was wonderful. But, but getting back to Dustin, you know, he loves this place. He will tell you he grew up here. My my wife would take him and some other kids to Brown basketball games yeah. when when you know I was traveling and things like that. And and he loves this university. But we're we're proud of him for what he does. He loves his job. He loves this university. He loves the people he works with. And I mean he's he, he's blessed. Yeah. He's blessed to be here. This is I don't know. Um, what my life would be without coming to Brown. 
as, as you know, I, I met my wife here. Uh, Probably I, the best thing that ever happened to you. The best thing that ever happened to <laughs> I met her in the cafeteria at the Ratty. Yeah, and uh, two a days. And we were finishing. She was back. Here. She was here early as a freshman. Yeah. I was here because we had football practice. And between sessions, I was going to lunch one, one, one day with Freddie Manuel, was an assistant coach. He was a receiver, uh, defensive back coach. And I'm walking towards to get something to eat because we had, you know, you had the uh, players' meals, different than the, yeah. back then anyway, and uh, training table. And I, I couldn't get my breath. I saw this girl sitting about that far, and she's sitting with nine other people. I never saw another soul. She gets embarrassed. To this day, she looked angelic. I could see her soul. Now, she had a beautiful face, yeah. big Angela Davis afro, yeah. right? And she's sitting just like off yonder, and I, I kind of point, and she does this, and I point again, the nerve of me, right? And yeah. I point again, and she said, me? I said, yes, yeah. come here. <laughs> and she came. <laughs> And the, rest is history. the rest is history, but here's what happened. So I asked her her name. I asked her where it's the dorm. Could I visit her in the dorm? And she said yes. And, and she tell, then tells the story. She goes back to the table, and she sits down. Now, my wife went to Fieldston, you know, private school in, in, in Riverdale area in, New, in the Bronx. And uh, she sits down. She's sitting next to a guy that was a freshman basketball player. And so the guy asked her, uh, what did he want? And she said, well, he wanted to know my name. And she tells this story. And, and he said, did he tell you who he is? She said, yeah, he said his name's Dennis. And he said, no, did he tell you who he is? And she says, yeah, he said, Dennis Coleman. And so Glenn Scotland, and, and he looked at her and said, you know, he's the quarterback of the football team. And she looked at him and said, what's the quarterback? <laughs> <laughs> when she told me. When she told me that story, I said, you're kidding. She said, yeah, I didn't know. She, you know, she, her mother and father, wonderful people, and her sister, and all her friends were girls. They, you know, two parents were generally girls. Yeah. So they went to the theater, and they went to the opera, yeah. and, 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 and all of that. And that's what, and Fieldston wasn't known for athletics. Uh, you know, it's a great academic institution. Yeah. And I said, you really don't know? She says, no. And I said to myself, I know she's the one. <laughs> and she eventually learned what a quarterback was in the oh, next two years, Oh, right? I think she did. <laughs> well, her dad would always come up, and she thought he was coming to see her. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he used to tease and say, yeah, you know, because now he had a chance to watch football games. He'd come to football games. The son he never he had. Son, and, and, and there were actually fans, Brown alums, that thought that he was my dad, right? Because <laughs> he'd be there hollering and screaming. My dad always came to games. But <laughs> Pop used to be there hollering and screaming again. He'd go to away games. <laughs> he'd go to games that she didn't go to. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> That's great. So just circling back to that moment that we'll be celebrating, you and Marty Vaughn, do you, do you look at yourself as a pioneer in, in certain respects for that particular moment? You know, Scott, and I've, I've, I've been trying to figure this out since you guys, and, and I'm thankful to Mike Bernard and, and Grace and everyone. This is a wonderful thing. I... Um, we were raised to be humble kids, you know, let your let your work speak for itself. And I remember I may have been in eighth or ninth grade and I was bragging about something. But my dad tore me a new one. He <laughs> said, we don't brag about anything. Yeah. Scripture tells you be humble, be kind, and let your work speak for itself. And that's the last time I ever, you know, I kid with my friends and we don't, no, I, I, I slammed you or, you know, we joke like that. But. Uh, um, so I generally don't cotton to things like this. Yeah. This one, I'm enjoying. This means a lot to yeah. me. I, uh, the grace of God, involved in something really special, Scott. Yeah. I, I help set the table. I, I, I have young people that tell me today that you, you made it possible for me to think that I could do. I I take a lot of pride in this now. This 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 occasion 
means a lot to me. Means a, at first I said, ah, you know, when I first heard about it and my kids were like, oh, dad, wait a minute. No, this means something. The general, uh, yep. my brother is, is, is and, and my older brother, they're just beside themselves. You know, hey, Denny, this, this is special, man. You, you should enjoy this. We are going to enjoy this. Yep. Uh, I, I still have grown men who were then kids come to me and say, you know what? I still have the chin strap you gave me, or I still have the wristbands. Wow. And, and it meant a lot. As I told you when we, we did the podcast, um, grown men in the community, black and white, but particularly in the black community, they would tell me, you know what? I went to Brown football games because of you. Wow. You know, we, we never thought when we heard that Brown had a black quarterback, we couldn't believe these are these are pillars of the community. Yep. Um, the Donald Lopes's and uh, um, um, Bobby Bailey's and, and, and others, um, Kenny Kenny Walker, right? You yep. know Kenny Walker. Sure. They were like Coleman. You don't even know, you know, uh, what it meant to us, and and what Brown by Brown doing that, we we looked at Brown University a little different. Not bad for a kid from Darby, Pennsylvania, huh? One of eight kids. How about that? Dennis, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right.